we have available in the state at the least price. Um, work by econ economists from Stanford, from PPIC has shown that recharging groundwater and using that, recharge, that, that recharged water um, um, uh, conjunctively using groundwater storage capacity in the way we're using surface water storage capacity is the cheapest way to expand on our ability to store water from wet years uh, where we have a large runoff number uh, numbers for the drier years where we actually lack the runoff that we have come to depend on in agriculture and in urban areas. So that, that management of that storage capacity, which in the Central Valley, um, some estimates you know, have, have come up with numbers that are on the order of 80 to 100 million, at least theoretically, 80 to 100 million acre feet. Um, that's no small amount. Even if we were to use a third of that, that would be a huge amount of additional storage um, that we have a storage capacity um, that we could add to what we already have. Um, the other piece is, and this speaks more to the question of why are we looking at the agricultural landscape to do recharge? Much of the additional water that we currently have going to the ocean, and that's not already spoken for in terms of water rights, it's not already going to irrigation, it's not already going into surface water storage, it's not already going to conjunctive use schemes, it's not already going into urban uh, recharge schemes. Most of that extra water comes over a very short period of time during the wet part, during the wettest part of the winter, in, in very wet years to begin with. And in, on, on a very big picture overview, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, there is no recharge basin that can be large enough to gobble up that amount of water in a short period of time. Um, the agricultural landscape, because of its footprint in the Central Valley, really presents that larger, much, much larger pool that could possibly be used at a very large scale for doing for doing recharge over relatively short periods of time. Now, even that landscape can't gobble up all that water all at once unless we really flood large amounts of land, uh, which is part of some of the thoughts, uh, part of the thinking and part of the scheming and part of the visioning that's happening um, between various stakeholder groups, Department of Water Resources and others. Uh, but um, even so, I think where we get the smartest solutions is when we um, operate groundwater recharge jointly with um, operating our surface water reservoirs and use our surface water reservoirs in a smart way to tuck away water from there before the big flood comes in groundwater, uh, perhaps um, to allow for more surface water storage to get that first flush that comes in these really wet years, store that in, on the surface water site, then put it away over a longer period of time in groundwater. So um, running these groundwater banks in the agricultural land, uh, landscape and all at the same time working with reservoir operators on their schedules so we can capture those short-term high peak flood flows um, and squirrel them away in, in, in a groundwater storage reservoir. Um, the other uh, purpose, of course, of doing recharge is to actually improve water quality. And some of you have indicated that actually is a prime interest of yours in seeing recharge done. Um, we have seen in some communities in this country, in this state, but also elsewhere, that doing um, recharge, intentional recharge in the source area of public water supply wells um, can improve significantly uh, water quality where it is impaired, especially where it is impaired with nitrates and salts. Another reason that farmers have always done groundwater recharge for as long as we have practiced agriculture in the state is to flush salts and nitrate out of the root zone. That is why we don't practice perfect irrigation efficiency. That's why we have to have more water applied than the plants use is to flush salts out of the out of the root zone, which then by by cor by correlation means that we often also flush uh, nitrate out, and I think the paradigm shift that's happening here is about disentangling the flushing of salts from the summer irrigation and going from 
um, flood irrigation with poor irrigation efficiency to a scheme where we have high irrigation efficiency that allows us to fully take advantage of the nitrogen fertilizer and the nitrate that's in, in, in the soil. And then once that's used up by the plants during the um, period when there's no uptake in the winter, then use recharge to flush salts and no nitrate out of the root zone. So that's, that's um, another part of this equation here. And then finally, if, um, there are a lot of opportunities to couple these recharge operations in the agricultural landscape with environmental benefits such as creating bird habitat. So let me uh, next speak briefly um, to how do we want to recharge and how we, how we think of how recharge occurs in the agricultural landscape. And I apologize, I don't have any images for this, but I hope that with a few bullets I can quickly address this. One is to do it just like urban areas already do by having set aside basins um, that are overlying highly permeable sediments um, that we fill with, with uh, this water to recharge groundwater. These are dedicated basins, they're there all the time. They would be regularly used. They would have very high infiltration capacities, upwards of 10 feet per year, 10 acre feet per acre per year, that is. Um, and they would typically have uh, an, 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 a relatively small footprint, you know, a few tens of acres, perhaps maybe a few hundreds of acres at the most at any one, at any one location. Another way to do recharge is to use flood irrigation in the winter um, use more, much more efficient irrigation in the summer, but use flood irrigation in the winter. Do that over large acreages in, in fields that are either fallow, that are between crops or in permanent crops while the crops are there. Um, focus on lands that do provide high infiltration capacities at four acre feet per acre or above. Um, and focus on areas where we can do this on a relatively regular basis when these flood waters are available. Another way to think about this, and some people have started to, to look into this, is to use, rather than do flood irrigation, do the same thing with reverse tile drains. And those would be basically tile drains that are sitting eight to 10 feet below uh, the land surface. They, would, they would, would allow us to recharge bypassing the root zone, bypassing whatever chemicals are in the root zone, and doing the recharge below that, um, and disentangle some of the complications that come with with um, doing this in an agricultural landscape, both with respect to the chemicals, but also with respect to the agronomic impacts to the crop. And finally, an, a fourth option is to think of doing recharge at low amounts, an acre foot per acre, two acre feet per acre, even on lands that are perhaps not as suitable for large recharge rates, but are suitable for doing recharge period in the winter, adding an additional acre foot or an additional two acre foot per acre over a really large landscape, um, which really then speaks to the, to the flat more option. So those are the four categories that I wanna put out there in terms of the main categories in which to think about um, recharge in the agricultural landscape. There's a ton of other questions that we need to address in this, uh, in this, in this context. And Helen Dahlke, who's done a lot of work, a colleague of mine who's done a lot of work um, on this um, has put uh, a nice slide together here of all the different considerations that go into this. And I don't wanna go into any of this and we probably won't be touching much on this. We're really gonna focus on the water quality aspect, but the water quality aspect actually links back to all of them, the crop suitability, the location, water availability, the hydrogeology, um, the costs and the, and, and the legal framework. Um, and so not that we, we're not gonna focus on these other ones, but we have to keep in mind, to keep them in mind as we speak about water quality today. So what are some of these groundwater quality considerations in ACMAR? They've all been touched on in this initial poll that Sue threw out here. One is we need to think about source water quality. When we, when we take water out of rivers, we typically take very high quality water, very low in, in salinity, um, very low with respect to nutrients. There's some concerns about what is being used in canals. There's, um, I think they're called algae sites um, to kill algae. There are some concerns about pesticide use and pesticides in, in that water. Um, but source water quality, the main concern there is to the degree it changes to chemistry in the unsaturated zone or in, in, in groundwater, um, it may precipitate out minerals that could clog the pore space. That's not as much of a concern when we do, when we do this in a landscape that's already used to seeing that same source of water during the summer being used for irrigation. 
the water quality effects on crops is an issue, and we'll talk about that. Practices that reduce the nitrate leaching and pesticide leaching specifically out of these areas that are being used for agricultural recharge um, um, need to be developed, thought about, um, you know, to the degree that we already, they already work, um, that is good, but that's definitely something to consider. Um, the legacy load, you know, to the degree that we have historically applied nitrogen and pesticides, um, that they're stored either in the deep ozone zone now, or that they're stored in shallow groundwater now, how does this legacy load move when we accelerate the movement of groundwater, the movement of water in the deep ozone zone when, uh, when applying uh, agricultural re recharge, both, as I said, both in, in the ozone zone and in groundwater. The native water quality versus research water quality, I spoke to that briefly under source water quality, avoiding the pore clogging by mineral deposition is a concern, um, more so when injecting, which is actually a fifth option, injecting water into wells, uh, or what's sometimes referred to as aquifer storage and recovery. Um, that's where that is, an, is, a, is a key concern. Um, and that's not something I think we're gonna see a lot in the agricultural landscape. That's going to be mostly done in urban areas. Um, and then thinking about, of course, how does ag recharge in the long term improve groundwater quality, even if there might be some of that legacy load moving through the system faster than it would otherwise do um, before these improvements can happen. I think a key concern that many of you have is we don't want to have any accidents. This is a key policy piece for improving our, our water resiliency, drought resiliency, our water storage capacity. We, don't, we cannot afford to goof this up. Um, this is a new scheme, this is a new approach. We want to show that we can be successful with this. And so it makes sense to pay really good attention to these issues. Um, I'm gonna just close with a few slides here. We have a lot of information on different land uses. We have information on uh, ability of our soils to um, take recharge. We have information on current and historic nitrogen loading. We have information on wells. The historic nitrogen, historic nitrogen lo loading is associated with historic land use. Um, and one of the resources is this groundwaternitrate.ucdavis.edu website where we've done 50 years of historic land use mapping and associated that with 50 years of historic nitrogen loading mapping that can be one of several resources to be used to look at, for example, the legacy loading. Another piece that has been done and other people are working on this um, is the um, um, economic viability of converting land use around disadvantaged communities in the source area of their public supply wells to something that increases the amount of recharge, um, increases the amount of good water quality water in groundwater, um, and uh, at the same time provides some of the economic benefits. And, and vineyards and vineyard replacement of some of these crops has been shown to be one of the eco uh, economically very viable options to move forward um, in terms of thinking about some land use changes, but also uh, it shows that nutrient management can do really well. And as to the latter, um, some work has looked at both the combination of changing land use or doing nutrient management or and or adding recharge in the source area of a, a public supply well in a disadvantaged um, community to see how that would improve groundwater quality in the long run. This was not a well that was in, in, in particular dire straits, but would have been in dire straits moving forward. And with these various options, we can affect various improvements in uh, water quality. Helen Dockley is working with a student on actually taking a lot of this information and putting this together uh, into a tool that will identify some of the most um, uh, important lands uh, that could be used to do recharge for all of the above uh, possibilities. Um, recharge to increase storage, to decrease drought, to increase drought resiliency and decrease the risk for drought well outages at the same time improve groundwater quality. Um, hey Thomas, final, are, yeah. are you about wrapping yeah, up? I'm, I'm done, just wanted to show a couple uh, image, images of some of the challenges that we're facing. The subsurface is exceedingly heterogeneous. These are 
five cross sec four cross sections that are each about 600 feet apart and about uh, 600 feet wide um, um, each. And the colors indicate the full range of materials that we find in that subsurface from yellow being sand to blue being clay. And it just shows the amount of variability in terms of the texture in the subsurface, which then is reflected in the variability that we often find when we take samples from the subsurface. This is on a, a nectarine orchard um, on a scale of about two or 300 feet, showing the variability of nitrate and coarse that are taken very close together. This is another example from a 160 acre orchard um, with samples uh, with core nitrates concentrations here shown relative to the drinking water limit in red. Um, and you can see there's huge variability both above the water table and below the water table at about 20, water table here is at about 20 feet. These cores are all about 40 feet long. Um, large variability in nitrate concentration, both vertically, but also across these wells, whether you go in north-south direction or in east-west direction. And what's interesting also is that the water quality that comes out of monitoring wells immediately below the water table, which is indicated here in orange, is not the same that we find when we core these. And so these variability issues are something that we need to address as we move forward. And that was it on my end, Sue. Um, and I can certainly take questions if there is time left, Sue. So we do have time for questions. I, you know, I don't see anyone using the chat for questions. If you want to hear more of what Thomas had to say before I cut him off, I mean, by all means, go to the chat and demand more Thomas Harder time. Um, we do have two more presentations um, and you can go ahead and use the chat all the way along. We can always capture it and during the panel discussion as well. Um, but since I don't see any questions in the chat, let, let's move to our second presentation. Um, our second presenter is Phil Pichon, who with Bashan and Associates, and Phil will be presenting um, information on some pilot on-farm recharge projects. So Phil, take it away. Okay. So I think people can now see my screen. Um, so not yet, I, Phil. I'm I'm not seeing your see. screen. How about now? Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks, Sue. Yeah. So I'm Phil Bashan, and I was going to talk about um, some of these uh, pilot studies and demonstration projects we've been working on, and um, I've been working on uh, on-farm recharge for uh, a near, about a decade now, um, and so I was going to talk about some engineering and management ideas about it and, and um, its relation to water quality. So the, uh, the first, uh, this is the first site we worked on. This is a Terranova Ranch uh, site down in uh, uh, west of Fresno. And uh, this is from 2011 when we uh, were flooding uh, vineyards um, beginning in about, effectively really beginning in, in about March and extending uh, this second picture over here is about May 5th or 6th. It was the last day of, of permanent continuous flooding that we were doing throughout this system. And um, when, when, we, when, when we're thinking about, you know, what it looks like to do to recharge, um, you know, we have, you know, I, I put together this water nutrient uh, budget showing uh, the crop application, fertilizer and, and irrigation water, what's going on in the root zone, invado zone, and what's going on in, in the groundwater table. And so um, this is where the recharge is applied. This is where you have subsurface movement. And, and then there's groundwater transport. And interesting, there's a lot of factors. You know, it, it's not, you know, on from recharge and Agmar is both complicated and simple. You know, from a simple perspective, you're just putting a lot of water on the ground and recharging. From from the more complicated perspective, there's a lot of factors that affect, you know, what your water quality and, and, and how effective your, your on from recharge is. And so, you know, it depends on your crop selection and land use that you're applying it on, your fertil fertility regi regimes that you've been implementing, your yield targets. Um, 
it also um, depends on the crop history, as uh, Thomas uh, mentioned, with regard to legacy loading, the texture, lithology. Thomas mentioned all three of these, um, and and then it depends on what your you know about the groundwater use, um, if it's being used for domestic or production purposes, what the background concentrations of the nutrients and other constituents are in it. Uh, the infiltration rate that you're getting to the groundwater for introducing groundwater, groundwater velocities, uh, you know, which direction it's going and how long does it take to get there relative to communicate, com community locations and, and then other water quality constituents of concern that might be in the area. So this talk is mainly about nitrate and salts, but, you know, if you have uh, volatile organic carbons or heavy metals or something else moving around the groundwater, you know, uh, recharge may offer you an op opportunity to create a barrier to their transport um, as, as also as mentioned by Thomas. And so when you look at, when you look at these factors, you know, some of them are related to farming. Some of them are just environmental, you know, things that you don't have any control over. And then some of them are related to your community planning in the vicinity and and so this is uh, some nitrate in pore water and this is pretty much what you would also see in salts. This is uh, from a study we did with sustainable conservation which we did a lot of cores on a lot of on, on several different types of crops and this shows almond grapes and tomatoes for both A soils which are very rapid um, pretty more sandy soils um, greater recharge rates, more suitable for recharge, and, and C and D soils, these are NRCS hydrologic classes, and these are less permeable. And you can see that in the A soils, you know, a lot of your constituents are, a lot of your nitrate and, and salts are fairly uniform down the entire profile, whereas in the, in the less permeable soils, um, it's, it's more variable. And that's because of your water movement and interferences with its transport. Uh, largely, and so if you if you have a really sand a deep sandy soil, um, then then you're going to be moving stuff, and that's both has implications with regard to what you can do farming wise, but what you can also do, um, also you know what it might mean with regard to your legacy loading. So um, a lot of our work on um, water quality is related to this study that we did um, under with sustainable conservation leading it, it was, an, it was a um, it was a specialty crop block grant study and uh, this is uh, in tetra tech uh, and i led the modeling effort for for looking at transport and we integrated uh, a crop model a uh, hydrus vetosome model and, and a groundwater model and these are these are the sort of the inf the information that we inputs into the model. We had grapes and they had much lower fertilizer rates and tomatoes at much higher. These are standard, this was taken from standard uh, uh, practices that are published by uh, FREP and, and others. Um, and then this is this is pretty representative of the of the Terra Nova site that we've been working on. And so uh, we have three successive recharge years followed by four successive dry years. That's sort of like the average condition there. And I think in this uh, situation, we were putting on 10 feet of water per year. I think that was it. Um, and so we, we looked at the result of what happened um, as far as, you know, up on the, through the Vado zone and into groundwater. And these are the mat, this is for mat, uh, grapes. This is a mass flux of nutrients uh, through of nitrate through the Vado zone um, being introduced into the groundwater system, and you can see that you know we, very early in this flooding cycle we see a lot of flushing, um, and this is mainly from the legacy loading that's in the in that uh, approximate 200 foot deep. Uh, Vado zone, 150, 200 feet. And then you can see this is the cumulative loading over time. And as you get, you know, past that first flush, you start to see, you know, incremental flushes. But these, 
subsequent philosophers are mainly do, doing with cultural practices that are ongoing. And this is a total amount that we flushed over this 40 year period. 75% was from the legacy loading. And then this is tomatoes. And this is a little bit of a different story. You have a big flush of legacy, but because of uh, tomatoes use a lot more nitrate during while they're being grown, they continue to have large inputs every flood cycle. And so you can see magnitude over time. And, and not only is there a lot more legacy loading from uh, tomatoes, but there's also a lot more loading related to current cultural practices. And so, so when we think about recharge and its effect on groundwater quality, one really needs to keep in mind that the legacy loading is an issue, uh, but it is, it's an issue that goes away. Uh, the issue that doesn't go away are your current cultural practices. Um, now this, these, these are sort of representative trends, you know, depending on how much you're flushing and what your rates are, you may, you may be able to um, have more dilution, but, um, but unless you're managing your cultural practices, you're gonna have this continual flushing. And so certain crops are, are gonna be less suitable for recharge either because they have a high fertilizer rate usage or they um, have relatively shallow root zones and they can't take up and, and, and the nitrate and fertilizers sort of go past them more quickly and, and, are, and are lost more quickly. Uh, this is the effect on groundwater and this is grapes um, and this is right under the field that's being recharged. This is 500 meters down, 1,000 meters 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, and 3,000. And, and this is in the domestic well area. And you can, this five was, um, it's just there for, for reference. But you can see over time, because of the, the um, rate of recharge, that even though we're getting this flush of nutrients coming in, that we really are generally diluting it below uh, what it was initially. And this effect, of course, is greatest at, at the location, this is in the domestic well zone. So this is like a 75 foot area where, where they're pulling domestic water. And over time, um, that, that effect you know, continues, uh, but as you get further away, it takes longer for that, for, for that effect to happen. So over a 40 year time frame, at 3000 meters past the recharge site, you're, you're really seeing very little impact from recharge. Now, tomatoes, is again, you have this big flush and it pushes up your nitrate levels in your groundwater right below your site pretty quickly over the first flush period. And then this is a five milligrams per liter again. Um, and then you can see that over time it starts diluting it. And that effect is felt most, most in the vicinity of it. Once you get beyond about a thousand meters, you don't see much of an effect period. And that, um, and that effect is longer and, and, and more dilute. Um, of note, even with this higher loading rate, you're still sort of hovering around the five. You're not really affecting your five. And so this speaks to you know, your cumulative volume of water, your cumulative nitrate loading. And then based on that, what's the sort of average milligrams per liter uh, of nitrate going in under grapes you know, over the long term, it's under, it's well under one, even with tomatoes over the long term. Initially, the, 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 rel the average concentration of the water is pretty high, but the average total concentration over time is dropping below five. And so even with a, a poorly managed system, or, or not necessarily a poorly managed system, but a high nutrient system, you know, there are potential benefits if you have enough water coming into the system. So, um, I'll skip that slide. So, so some of the tools that we can talk about with regard to managing water is, you know, reducing our legacy loading uh, by selecting our lands that, we're, that we want to do recharge on. Crop selection helps us with our fertilizer needs and our fertilizer flexibility. Um, and then high recharge rates, you know, that is also, you know, a crop issue, uh, your, your soils issue. And then really importantly, and, and, and not really talked about much, is its management. So the, the way you get most your recharge, a most effective recharge system on an ag system is you're trying to manage your uniformity of your hy hydrology throughout the system. 
uh, the more uniform hydrology you have, then the more greater opportunity for recharge on that site, the more likely you're to be able to benefit from the, from the positive um, um, characteristics it might have for recharge. And so these are some things that you can do that we've done in our pilot studies for uniformity. We've used polypipe systems for uniform, uniform distribution of water along rows. We've looked at silt fences for providing a dam. And this was very promising. We did, did this last year in, on a pecan orchard in, in McFarland. Um, you know, importantly, you know, a 0.1% grade, which is pretty typical of farmland, is about a three foot drop over half a mile of length. Now that's not, so a lot of these far ag fields are about a half mile long. And so you're dealing with this grade issue the whole, whole way. And so the other thing that we've looked into is using polypipe, but not for transporting water, but as an inflatable dam that you'd throw up. And this is very simple to lay out. You can lay it out any way you want, either in, with the row or across the row. It allows you an immediate ability to, to pile up water uh, pretty high. You know, these things are about, I don't know, 14 inch diameter, or 16 inch diameter polypipe. So this is effectively, you know, an excess of one foot dam. If you were to lie, you know, four of these across your, your half mile field, you'd be able to have even flooding pretty much across the whole thing. Um, these are some of the rates that we've seen with recharge on these lands at the Terra Nova studies, we see about two to three inches per day. Those soils, those are like class C or D soils um, that really aren't managed except that we're applying water uh, to them. Uh, we had the McFarland suffer these last four where we have periodic and continuous flooding. The periodic flooding ones, we get about 2.4 inches per day and 3.4 inches per day. Um, because of the management. Uh, on the continuous ones, last year we've got four, but this year we got 11 inches a day um, and as high as 13 inches a day. And so these, this fairly simple ma management methods that we implemented, we're getting a foot a day of water on these sites, which is really impressive. And you know, over a six week period, we've put 40 feet of water on that site. And so when you talk about you know, that kind of loading, um, 13 on the periodic, 40 on the continuous this year, 11 last year, um, that kind of loading really solves a lot of the water quality issues that you might have um, if you're putting on high quality water. The last thing I wanted to talk about is, is thinking about, you know, recharge and, 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 and sort of the background, you know, what are farmer assumptions that with, with their crop, crops. And so, and, and I'm not, you know, I, I come from a small history of farming as my wife is, uh, family is, is farmer, have been farmers. Uh, um, and and we're, she's not doing that anymore. So uh, that history is probably over. But, um, you know, um, I'm, I don't want to misrepresent what farmers are thinking, but I think these are fairly reasonable assumptions, um, you know, that in, in, in recharge, uh, you know, the idea is to protect, you know, wanting to protect the crop's annual performance. And that has been something that has been a focus of recharge um, over the last five, you know, five or 10 years with regard to on-farm recharge. But, but I would say that really what you're trying to do is you're trying to protect your longer term crop performance. This is sustainability. And this year's crop performance may not be as important as what it might mean for your next five or 10 years. Uh, there's a, you know, crop gains and losses are a farmer's responsibility. I think that is pretty true typically, but in the age of Sigma, you know, there's these losses, gains and losses are also community concern if a farmer's actions are benefiting the community. And so in, in the world of Sigma where a farmer's action can help improve with groundwater sustainability, there needs to be some consideration of what, what it means with regard to individual risk and some kind of, um, uh, actions to help mitigate that risk. Um, there's been a lot, a lot of farmers have done low recharge rates, and this is similar to what Thomas just talked about in his last example, where really they're primarily motivated by root zone salt management. If you go out, or, you know, talk about farm, with farmers if they've done recharge, often what they really are talking about is having done this. But what we're really talking about is more high rate recharge 
to promote uh, groundwater dilution of salts and nitrates, but also to really promote more effective uh, on-farm recharge approaches and, and, and efficient use of lands. Um, fertilizer has been insurance for crop production, uh, but really um, fertilizer use efficient efficiency may be more important than getting the highest yields. Uh, this is with regard to how, how you might be spending your money for growing your crop, but also about your cultural practices to protect groundwater. And then high yields on maximum acres is the most profitable economic model. This is really the Central Valley model. You know, and, and as we've looked at, you know, acre, you know, acreage and production for the last 30 or 40 years, it's about the same. Uh, but the yields have kept on going up and up and the demands have kept on going up and up. And under Sigma, that is really not sustainable anymore. Um, and so, um, so these are sort of shifts in, 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 in farm agricultural thinking that are occurring um, now or will be. And, 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 and recharge has to be considered in, in, in this context. Um, and that's all I have, Sue. Okay, so we do have a couple questions for you. We have a question for Thomas as well, and then um, a couple items that uh, we could talk about during the panel discussion. I just wanna make sure, uh, Jennifer and Scott, you know that I, um, with regard to uranium and turbidity, we can talk about other water quality concerns during our panel discussion. Um, but for Phil, there are a couple of questions. Um, one about uh, nitrate decay in the groundwater system and in, um, in the Vado zone, it, whether or not you took that into consideration. Um, in, in that, in that mo the models that we've done, we haven't. Um, we've taken what's uh, uh, used the current nitrate condition in the, in the Vado zone um, and, and have not really put much towards denitrification. I think that you know, nitrate decay is, is, a, is an organic carbon, is, is a carbon dependent process. And, um, and, and then so, you know, the sandy soils, I, I would not expect it to be, especially if you're doing higher rate recharge, higher rate recharge, I would not expect it to be really as important. Okay. And then there's a question about whether or not you took into account um, just the total nitrogen apply or whether or not the, the, the crop you took into account crop uptake. Yeah, we, we, our crop, we took in, uh, we looked at um, what was applied and what was the crop uptake and then the net that came out of that. Right. So, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the question for Thomas. Thomas, if you're available, um, let's see. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, uh, there was some, a question about, uh, yeah, clarifying your units of recharge rates uh, foot per, per year, I'm assuming relates to water availability limitations. A site-specific recharge rate can vary uh, from less than 0.1 foot per day to one foot per day. Yes. So the, the units that I was mentioning on one of the slides for recharge um, are similar to what Phil used. So when I talk about four feet per, per year of additional recharge, that's really four acre feet on one acre per acre of land of additional recharge. So it's basically water that's four feet, four feet deep percolating into the ground. Um, 10 feet per year means 10 acre feet on a one acre piece or 10 acre feet per acre of land, meaning you have a water column 10 feet high that and, and you're not applying all 10 feet of water all at once, but you know, over, over whatever period of time you have for recharge, three months, four months, you totally apply 10 feet of water, 10 feet depth of water, maybe in half of increments, if that makes sense. Well, here in the chat, if it doesn't, right? And then there are a couple questions for me um, about availability of the presentations. We are recording this meeting. I did belatedly hit the record button, but we, we started recording right as Thomas started his presentation. The recording will be posted on the Central Valley Water Board's Irrigate Lands website when it's available. I'll send out a liar's list when, when it's available. Um, and then and the other question for me was, why are we talking about this at the Irrigate Land Stakeholder Meeting? 
And so, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, this was requested during the last stakeholder meeting. And on-farm um, recharge projects can happen on irrigated lands, enrolled parcels. And so, you know, it is something that we are tracking in the program and de definitely any guidance for protecting and improving water quality is something of interest. So um, with that, I wanna move to our third presentation. Um, Daniel Mountjoy, who is the Director um, of Resource Stewardship with Sustainable Conservation is going to talk about developing guidance for protecting and improving water quality associated with on-farm recharge projects. So I think I, we have to stop sharing your, your screen, Phil, so that Daniel can get his presentation up. Thank you, Sue. Great. All right, so definitely want to keep the, the theme of IRLRP, you know, how does this tie into crop management? And really this comes up around the idea of what sort of guidance do we all need to be thinking about as we think about increasing recharge? And um, what I'm gonna talk about is first is just the increasing interest in recharge by farmers and irrigation districts and GSAs. And um, the, that, that increasing demand and the degree of awareness around water quality issues is something that I think um, a lot of us are, are seeing as, as something that needs to be, um, more information needs to be made available. So this talk really is about how do we get information such as we've heard from Thomas and Phil and is still being developed, how do we get that information out to, to farmers and what, what can we actually say at this point um, about the, the transport and risk of nutrients versus the dilution effects. So um, like um, Thomas did, I think it's really important for us to, when we're talking about recharge, think about the different recharge options that are out there and their relative water quality risk. Um, Dedicated recharge basins that are commonly used by irrigation districts, of course, are probably one of the safer methods where they've been built on land that um, has not had farming um, on it before. So it's clean water coming off of rivers being recharged straight into the ground. But as these recharge basins get built on farmland, um, such as um, new on-farm, where sometimes being called micro basins that Thomas also mentioned, um, we have to be thinking about what the land use was prior to that basin being developed. And then as Thomas talked about um, cropland, a variety of different croplands, and really the range of risk increases as we move from fallow fields to permanent crops in terms of the current management. Um, fallow fields, of course, don't have um, new nutrients being applied, but as we move into annual crops and transitioning fields between crops, as well as permanent crops, we do need to think about the nutrient management occurring on those fields currently, and that's where the Irrigated Lands Program is very relevant, as Tom or as Phil pointed out. Um, certain crops, it's their current management that's the greater risk. And so, thinking about the the relative contribution of current management to legacy um, historic land use is is a key thing to think about. I did just want to point out that there's other forms of recharge um, that can occur on on other acreages where water quality might be less of a concern, um, increasing interest on um, converting land such as you see in the current water bank where it's, it's wild land, it's basically not farmed, a significant amount of recharge can occur there. Also floodplains, um, lands that might be subject to flooding, um, either with historic farming or um, not farming on them, those are all potential areas for recharge to occur um, that may have less risk. So this is the bigger picture around, you know, in the locations where we are recharging on farmland, we do need to think about fertilizer management. And as we've heard from, from Phil, quantity matters. Um, sites like um, Don Cameron's farm in um, Fresno County and Al Costa's farm, where we've been working with um, grape recharge, we're seeing significant quantities of water being applied. Um, average of three feet on Don Cameron's original work, but Phil pointed out some um, greater numbers per year, up to 10 feet. Um, Al Costa's farm in San Joaquin County had 19 feet of water put on it last year. And Helen Dalkey has um, demonstrated significant amounts of water on alfalfa as well. So there's crops where it is well suited for large quantities of water um, at the right times of year. Um, 
And I also wanted to just show in one irrigation district that's promoting uh, groundwater recharge, the increasing interest in recharge that's happening. From 2017 winter recharge program to 2019, almost a threefold increase in the number of growers, the number of acres, and um, nearly, nearly uh, more than doubling of the total acre feet of recharge on those fields. And their fall program, which is sort of a novel time to do recharge when there's flood or water released from reservoirs prior to the rainy season, additional water can be captured. And we're seeing really significant uptake in farmers interested in putting the water in after the harvest on a number of crops. What's interesting to see here is this increased interest of in recharge in Madeira, um, the, the, inc the use of on-farm recharge now surpasses their dedicated um, district recharge basins um, in 2019. So as, as Thomas pointed out, this, this approach is gonna be critical to capturing flood flows, especially with climate change, and there's growing interest in it. What we need to think about is where that water is being recharged and how much is going on different crops. In those fall 2019 projects, um, it's really interesting to see the growers that participated, the 55 growers that participated, some of them were only putting on you know, less than a quarter of a foot of water. Others were putting on a foot more than almost two feet of water over an 11 day recharge period. And with an average being less than you know, half a foot, this is, again, using those same metrics that um, we were just talking about. This is acre feet of water per acre. Um, grapes, similar large range, pistachios, large range. What's of concern for water quality here is when a grower is doing recharge, but only putting on these very small amounts of water, um, this is where the risk occurs, where we're likely to mobilize um, current and legacy nutrients and not provide that additional flush to help dilute it. And so, when a district starts to see expanded interest in recharge, one of the key lessons from this is rather than seeing everybody do a little bit, it would be much wiser to prioritize recharge to those growers that are willing to put on the higher rates because we're gonna see less leaching out of those fields than we would out of the ones that are just, or not less leaching, but more dilution as a result of their greater applications. Um, also, there's a number of management strategies around uh, recharge. We've already heard mention of the subterranean recharge where water is put through a filtration system into the ground and um, tile drains underneath the orchard take that water in, as, as this grower is explaining. But also on um, surface water recharge, some growers are experimenting with strategies where they can do alternate row recharge, as in this young orchard, um, where the rows in between are being are recharged, where the, whereas the other one is where they can apply nutrients at the time of uh, leaf out and not have the same uh, leaching risk. Um, or they do this in alternate patterns for crop health management so that they don't saturate the soil as excessively as if they were recharging the entire field. So growers are innovating and coming up with strategies both for nutrient loss, but also to uh, manage crop health. And all of these things need to be you know, thought about in terms of what's the risk. When we do think about drinking water, um, it's key that the, the risk of, of on-farm recharge certainly does have that additional um, increase in accelerating leaching of current fertilizers and pesticides as well as legacy materials. But, um, and, and then the potential to contaminate currently drinkable groundwater. As Phil pointed out, you know, with that tomato example, if you had drinkable water and then did a flush of, of nutrients, you could actually surpass the drinking water standard if that recharge was done too close to a, a public or a private um, domestic well. On the other hand, in the long term, we have the potential to improve groundwater quality through the dilution and increase the reliability of access to groundwater for communities. Um, we've certainly had conversations um, with community um, representatives who have said um, it may be worth it to have a decline in water quality in the short term if we can ensure reliability of water in the long term. And that's something that is still pointed out, that's a community decision that has to be taken into consideration when you're promoting groundwater near domestic or community water systems. And as everyone's pointed out, this is certainly a low cost water replenishment and ultimately long-term groundwater restoration strategy. In terms of building knowledge and information around um, recharge, the FLEDMAR effort initiated by um, the Department of Water Resources 
team um, led to a number of us working together um, to look at a variety of different strategies to maximize groundwater recharge and supply using floodwaters. And the development of the FloodMar Research and Data Development Plan that I know many of you were involved in, appreciate all that input. We're now at the phase of what are we gonna do with that plan? What's the implementation of that gonna look like? And a, um, the FloodMar network is being established. And I know Jenny Mars on the call today. She's leading um, that effort. But it really is the, the effort to bring together the, the players and the information and the resources to answer some critical questions. And from that plan, the, the key issues around water quality were the need for better um, web-based platform to allow access to existing knowledge, um, but it also developing better knowledge about water quality issues. Um, this is a lot of the work that Phil was just demonstrating would be a great example of that kind of knowledge development and what Helen Dahlke is working on. And then developing guidance and multi-criteria decision-making tools to address these water quality issues at, at FloodMar projects. Um, those are all multi-year, uh, large, high cost, some of those very high cost efforts that are going to need to take place. Um, what we've been realizing is I look at the number and increased interest in recharge by farmers and water districts and GSAs and certainly called out for in GSPs, um, we need to get guidance out there immediately. And so um, we look to see what, what is already out there. And you've heard several of these items already. Um, Thomas's um, crop history and potential nitrate loading maps, the study that Phil just did on nitrate leaching risk from specialty crops, we saw this diagram, but also um, the Environmental Defense Fund has developed a protecting groundwater in California management considerations for geo, um, you know, um, native materials in the soils that need to be considered when doing recharge and the recent UCSB um, Bren School Recharge Resilience Tool that just is, just came out during the FloodMar um, presentation recently. These are all tools that are designed to help manage recharge to protect water quality for communities. They, they help us with the information that's needed, both in data and maps, knowledge and, and models, and, and some guidance. There's also um, new water quality guidance coming out around targeting recharge to improve water quality for communities. This is less about how do you manage the land to reduce the loss of nutrients and more about where should we focus recharge. And Helen Dahlke's um, team has recently come out with the Agricultural Groundwater Recharge Assessment um, that Thomas mentioned. And then at Sustainable Conservation in partnership with Earth Genome, our Groundwater Recharge Assessment Tool allows uh, viewers to look at where recharge suitability is best, where disadvantaged communities are located, and um, soon we're going to be able to link it to Thomas's maps in terms of where's land use history and legacy loading associated with really highly suitable recharge sites. Um, in this case, um, for, for a rural community um, where we might want to see a bunch of recharge occurring and there might be really suitable recharge conditions in terms of getting the water into the ground, but it happens to be a bunch of hot spots in terms of legacy loading. We want to be very specific in where those recharge um, events occur and where those projects are um, implemented. So um, I wanted to let folks know that a number of the, the folks on this call um, are working together right now to get out some guidance, best available information by this fall, um, working with a number of technical partners, um, Phil and, and Thomas, as well as Peter Nico from Lawrence Berkeley Lab and Helen Dalkey and uh, Vicki Kretzinger are all um, providing input into what can we reasonably say at this point to inform growers and water districts and also engaging environmental justice, environmental NGOs um, in terms of what their concerns are and what should be included in this. And um, Hannah Waterhouse is working on this now um, with us to, to compile the existing research, identify the considerations and develop this guidance uh, by this fall so that we can ensure that um, recharge that's being done, there at least is guidance out there to avoid negative impacts and in fact improve um, groundwater quality and quantity over time and avoid deg degrading groundwater that's, that's safe to drink at this point. And just to give you a sense of the types of management guidance that tie in perhaps to the Irrigated Lands Program more closely is um, practicing good nutrient management between and during recharge operations 
um, certainly compliance with the IRLOP program, but thinking about the timing of that management as well. Avoiding intentional recharge on fields with historic um, or current flood irrigated dairy lagoon water, in other words, high loading, as well as other um, high loaded um, demand, high demand nutrient crops, trying to focus on lower ones like grapes, as uh, Thomas mentioned. Applying more water on fewer acres to maximize the dilution of legacy loading. And fields should be re used repeatedly over time. This was really one of the essences of Phil, the study that we did with Phil, is putting water on multiple times over the years on the same sites. You only leach the legacy nutrients once, and then it's your current management that affects the, the loading from then on. And then also, of course, thinking about location, not doing recharge um, adjacent to a, a drinking water well that's currently safe to drink. So those are some of the ideas of guidance that we're working on, and we'll be looking to add, expand on this and add to it to um, provide greater support to those that are seemingly starting to gain more interest in this practice. That's it, Sue. So I don't see any questions for, um, oh, we just got a new question, a new message. Um, Oh, so there's a, a comment from um, in the audience about having the preliminary guidance be about prioritization versus prohibitions. Um, I, I think there's, there's also another comment earlier about um, making sure that short-term declines in water quality um, be um, only acceptable if there are um, Frameworks in place that that address impacted communities. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't see. I don't see any questions specifically for you, Daniel. I think at at this point, um, I am going to take a quick a five minute break. It is now 11:07 by my clock. I'm. I'll, we'll be coming back at 11:12 um, ish with and start our um, panel discussion. Okay, I'm going to. Um, Wow, there are a lot of you. Might be a six minute break by, by the time I get this done. Uh, Anything I can help us, Sue? No, I think we're okay. You know, um, may, you know, I was thinking we were going to um, to pull the panel into a breakout room, but maybe it's not necessary to do that. Maybe I, I maybe we could start with the panel discussion. I mean, I know that there are. Um, there are some topics that were brought up. I mean, different water quality concerns. I mean, I, I think Thomas addressed uranium a, a bit in the chats, but also turbidity was brought up as a water quality concern. I think that that prevents um, the ability to infiltrate water over time. Um, you know, that's that's an issue. Um, like I mentioned, you know, we can we can speak to sort of the 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 issue. Two other issues I just brought up: um, the, you know, the long-term decline in water quality and how, when, and how that might be acceptable. Um, and then also um, the the guidance being more of a prioritization versus prohibition. And and, and maybe we can talk a, a little bit more about that. And then we just got a couple more chats. I. Um, I was thinking I wanted to get the panel together to kind of walk through um, which topics we wanted to discuss as a panel, but I know that there are a number of things um, that have been brought up, right? You know, the, um, the use of being kind of 
the proactive mechanisms to for, for growers who are interested in on-farm recharge projects to at least reduce um, potential nitrate leaching. And that, that's a topic we can talk about as well. Um, I think, why don't we start with the, the other water quality issues? Um, um, turbidity, uranium, you know, and, and other geogenic um, issues. If, if we want to kind of dive into that, because um, quite frankly, I'm having a hard time finding your names to pull you into a breakout room. Uh, you know, that's what I was hoping to do with the panel, and maybe that's not really even necessary to do. So maybe um, we can we can start the panel discussion. I, Charlotte, are you are you here as well? I just want to make sure. Okay, uh, I just want to make sure we have all of our panelists. Um, the, the presenters have been introduced. I want to make sure I present. Um, I introduce the other two panelists as well. Um, Lisa Hunt is a director with California River Restoration Science with American Rivers, and then it'll take me five minutes to introduce Charlotte. She is the the director of water resources with the Kings River Conservation District coordinator for the Kings River Water Quality Coalition and the program administrator for the North and South Forks Kings Groundwater Sustainable, Sustainability Agencies and the Kings Basin Water Authority, a woman with many, many hats. <laughs> um, so, um, How do we want to start the panel discussion? Um, uh, Thomas, you you talk, uh, Lisa. I see your hand up, but you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, one of the issues you mentioned was um, other other pollutants, um, and that includes. The geogenic contaminants like someone someone brought up uranium um, but there are a number of others like arsenic is, is a big one that's um you know already a big issue in drinking water um in the central valley um thomas mentioned a couple of the legacy pesticides um like uh, tcp which you know those ones are tcp is pretty widely found as well um and um but then there's also the the current use pesticides which um you know, many of which are not, are really just starting to be found in groundwater. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a concern because, you know, the, one, the ones that we're finding in widely in groundwater now are ones that were, you know, used 30 or 40 or more years ago. Um, the current use ones um, are, when they were registered, um, the modeling that was done wasn't done with recharge conditions in mind. It was done, you know, in typical agricultural irrigation um, conditions. So that's, that, that's something that um, hasn't been discussed much. Um, but I, I do want to point out that for some of the other, uh, some of the geogenic contaminants, um, I believe that Daniel mentioned the guidance document um, that um, EDF put out in collaboration with, with Stanford researchers and others. Um, and that it, it's, you know, it's a bit complicated with some of those um, geogenic contaminants um, because it really depends a lot on the situation on whether recharge would be likely to um, either improve or, or um, further impact the water quality. Something like arsenic, for example, um, you know, there, there's recent evidence showing that just drawing down the water um, table in the aquifer will often lead to higher concentrations in, in wells. So um, it's likely that recharges by increasing the water table might um, lead to decreased concentrations of arsenic in, in the groundwater and in drinking water wells. But there is limited information. So um, I would say a lot of those are more complicated um, than the situation with nitrates, um, and um, it's it's a bit hard to give you know general, easy, easily applicable guidance. Um, but I, 
I agree. Um, you know, Daniel talked about the need for guidance, and I agree that really it, it's a big need um, so that these issues do get evaluated when selecting rechar sites. Um, I I think there, there's a huge potential for um, improving water quality with recharge, and if it's done in a way that you know with, with careful planning um, and design. Um, but I recently reviewed a bunch of the, the um, GSPs in, in the San Joaquin Valley, and um, it doesn't appear that the you know, proposed or potential recharge locations in many cases were selected with water quality considerations in mind. Um, just for an example, I, you know, there's some cases where um, the underlying, the, the water quality in groundwater at the recharge location is good. Just take nitrates as an example. So low levels of nitrates in the current groundwater, but um, some of the sites have very high historical nitrate loading um, rates. So you would expect that in, in those cases, you might have you know, currently clean groundwater that could be um, degraded um, with respect to, to nitrates in the future. On the other hand, some of them were the opposite, where you have high nitrate concentrations in groundwater um, and very low nitrate um, loading rates on that land that they're proposing to use for recharge. So that would be a good situation. But I guess what I'm saying is there doesn't seem to be a process right now. Um, that's being used for um, applying, so, you know, applying some kind of um, practices or guidance to evaluate water quality um, during this, the planning and design stage, and that that's a real need. Um, so I'm I'm happy that some um, some guidance is in the process of being developed um, because, as I said, I think that there's enormous potential to um, if recharge is used strategically to really accelerate reaching the, the you know, human right to water goals um, to provide cleaner water for communities. But it really, it really needs to be done carefully. I think there's general guide, I mean, agreement on um, and support for guidance, right? And it's just the manner how, how it's going to be used and um you know there's some some comments in the chat about um maybe limited opportunities for recharge and there's a concern that um um you know that we want to make sure that that um with those limited supplies that that, that folks are not um keep keep as much as possible in the basin and and you know, so there's that there's that issue as well. Does anyone want to speak to that? Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. Um, I think Casey had the, the comment and I, I think there definitely are limitations on where water can go. And I think just the example from the Madera Irrigation District um, and we're finding this with the other districts we're working with when water is available, the districts really have the capacity to offer that water um, to either to everyone or to, to focus that water on, on specific sites. And that's, that's really the kind of question here is how, how, what kind of decision-making process should they go through in terms of prioritizing that water? Um, you know, do you give it to anyone who's willing to take it? Or do you um, choose sites that have really high infiltration rates? Or do you choose sites that have low nutrient um, crops grown on them or low um, nutrient um, historic crop use? And so, you know, there's a number of factors there that could be considered. Um, but it, the, one of the things we hear from the district is how can they do that objectively and in a way that doesn't you know, seem to give preference to, to you know, some individual over another. And so again, using, using data to be able to make those kind of decisions is something we're doing with our groundwater recharge assessment tool, um, but we need to add the, the water quality component to it as well as where's the site that can take the most water most quickly and most compatibly with the crops. Yeah, I'd like to uh, make a couple comments on that. Um, so for, I first wanted to talk about sort of the nitrate and salt thing that was that Lisa talked about and these other constituents, you know, uh, 
you know, when, when I look at all of the like water quality issues, of course, nitrate is, is a problem from a drinking water perspective, but, but nitrate is probably the least of your problems as far as like, you know, salts, salts are going to close down a system. You know, these other constituents that, that Lisa's talked about, you know, if they're not easily treatable, then, you know, uh, they're an issue too. So, so, you know, when I look at, you know, water quality, we, we always talk, we talk a lot about nitrate, but in the back of my hand of the two, salts is really there um, in the, you know, that I'm really thinking about. Um, I, I think that there's a, there's this local and regional thing about recharge and, and, and Thomas has brought it up a little bit. Um, Graham Fogg's been brought up a little bit by Daniel. You know, and 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 I focus mainly on, on local stuff, on, on local management, um, and, and this whole lo you know local recharge effort is really a, a function of Sigma and the groundwater sustainability agencies trying to come to there's this get to groundwater sustainability, and they all work they're working within their their local area, and and they and so they look at potential water supplies and water sources and management of that. And, and so there, when you think about efficiency for California, it, it would be a more regional approach that would be really beneficial. And, and that then brings into this idea that, you know, for, for effective groundwater recharge program, flood mar program, OFR program, whatever you want to call it, you know, you have to start really also start thinking about water marketing and water transfers and water trades and ways of facilitating that so that you can move your water around to places that are, are more suitable for recharge um, at some time or that you can bank water more easily or all these other things that are really, you know, I spoke mainly about farm practices, but there's a whole whole range of regional practices that have to go on for this program to be really successful. And, and then, and then, you know, I think like when, when I've worked with GSAs, you know, there's, there's these thoughts about farmers wanting to do the recharge. They want to have access to the water um, and sort of somewhat a, not a total appreciation, appreciation of what Sigma is about, which is Sigma is about getting your groundwater basin in sustainability. And, and the act of one farmer and the recharge of one farmer is really a community investment. And so um, I think that when we, when we think about, you know, farmers, you know, where do we prioritize locally and, and are we affecting some farmers or not? You know, the farmers, I think, I think when you, when you think about their use of recharged water, if they're doing in lieu recharge where they're capturing water for, they're, they're using surface water as a replacement for groundwater for growing crops. So that's something that has an immediate benefit to them. But if they're doing direct recharge, that's really a community effort. And whether, you know, farmer A or B or C is doing it is, is kind of irrelevant as long as you're getting to sustainability in your basin. So. So I'd like to chime in here. So um, as a GSA, this is one of the tools on a very short list of tools uh, that a GSA has to achieve sustainability. And I do want to note too that there are a lot of farmers out there that do not have a surface water supply. So they solely rely on groundwater. And in those areas, when they have the opportunity to capture the water, that is uh, not claimed by anyone else, the, the types of water that, that Dr. Harder was mentioning earlier, uh, where it's not permitted by anyone and it's those, those essential floodwaters, that opportunity for them to capture that and replenish their groundwater because that is their sole source, I think is really important. And, and in those areas, um, you know, where, where they don't have the surface water, and, and, and the guidance that, that you would provide where they can be proactive and put in the mechanisms and, and do uh, uh, change their practices in certain ways to where they're conscientious of the, of the water quality is really important in those areas because that's really the only tool they have to, to, do, um, to be good stewards for, for their aquifer. And the other thing, um, Two, I wanted to mention is when, when we're talking about how this nexus with the irrigated lands regulatory program and also 
um, developing short-term solutions for those uh, increases in nitrate, I think that nexus happens in the CV salts management zone. And I think that the GSAs do play a really important role in, in, in the management zone development specifically for this purpose for recharge and how we look at water quality, where they're recharging, what their intentions are. I think within those management zones that we're currently developing and trying to understand and getting those, those folks involved in that, I think the GSAs play a really big role and this recharge concept and, and understanding on-farm recharge will be really important in that process. Charlotte, maybe a question to you from your perspective, you know, to the degree that uh, you have these solely groundwater dependent areas where, where you have folks that don't have access to surface water, they, they don't even have the infrastructure uh, in place to have access to surface water. How much do you see, um, is it going to be possible for those areas to collaborate with areas that are upstream of these groundwater dependent areas uh, that could do the recharge because they do have the infrastructure in place, they do have access to that extra surface water uh, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, do you see collaborations evolving in your basin to do that? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, Phil could probably chime in on this uh, more so than I, but the Terra Nova project is in, a, is in an area where there's limited surface water supply and, and KRCD uh, partnered uh, with uh, Terra Nova Ranch to, to develop uh, structures that allow that for um, many, many acres of, of farmland for on-farm recharge. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that too. The, um, I mean, if, when you look at the King's Basin um, and, all, and the several GSAs in it, I, I think that there's definitely a sort of learning process going on. You know, what, what, it, what it means to like get to sustainability. And of course, you know, one of the sustainability, you know, for all the sustainability agencies to be successful, it will require the basin to come into sustainability. And so, you know, Thomas, your point that you could do groundwater recharge upstream of, of an area so that you can augment groundwater flow downstream is, is an important um, um, issue. And, and, I, and, and as they think about where they're gonna move water in that basin, you know, there, there, is, there is, you know, uh, a, um, there is the, 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 the idea that you want to control your water within your own irrigation district or water district. And then there's, on the other side is the, is the need to come to sustainability with, with, within the groundwater basin. And those two, there's a t push and pull going amongst those two drivers right now. And, and I think over time, they'll, they'll come together, uh, but it'll be, it'll be a process. And, and, and over in the turnover region that Charlotte talked about, you know, we're, they're, 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 and, and there's, definitely starting to think about, you know, how, how do we play a role in regionally helping the area get to groundwater sustainability? They're, they're in the midst of building arc, um, infrastructure to move water around and to promote on-farm recharge. And then it's like, well, okay, how, you know, what are the ultra, multiple uses of that infrastructure and, and how might it benefit everyone in, in the basin and, and how do you connect to projects and all of that? So I think the on-farm recharge technology is really important, and it, and I think it fundamentally underlays uh, is a foundation for how you manage your water in the future, statewide and, and regionally wide. But but so there's that role. But the other role of it is, is it facilitates is it's it's a it's a way of facilitating movement in these other areas like water trades and transfers and and connectivity with projects and all of those things that and allow you more flexibility. In your in your water infrastructure and its management, so. I think one of the pieces like to, to keep. Go ahead. I just wanted to comment on, on Charlotte's comment. I think Charlotte, you really bring up an important piece about the sort of the, the different roles that GSP or GSAs play, that the CV salts management zones play, and then the irrigated lands program plays in this discussion. And you know, we talk about sustainability in a basin under Sigma. 
And you know, oftentimes that sounds like what we're just trying to do is balance the water quantity, but the but the water quality aspect of that is is one of the other you know, obvious goals in there. And so, in reviewing and looking at the the GSPs, you know, the water quality is oftentimes passed on to well, the irrigated lands program or the CV salt program that are going to address that. And I think what what we're really identifying here is the need to coordinate these different efforts so that we can actually achieve groundwater sustainability across all six undesirable effects. And a key piece of that is prioritizing that recharge to benefit those communities where water quality is an issue. Um, if we recharge near a community that has water quality issues, that, that water quantity also benefits the whole basin. And it immediately addresses what is currently a high cost mitigation need for those communities that are already threatened. And it can also be used to avoid additional costs of mitigating loss of water quality or quantity in communities that are dependent on groundwater. And so if, if we're going to avoid increasing costs through the CV salts program for trying to provide alternative water supplies, one way to do that is to have the, the Sigma effort, the GSAs recognize that recharge close to communities done in appropriate ways using irrigated lands program you know, standards in terms of new, current nutrient management, we can actually start to hit multiple objectives at once. Um, and really we need to be optimizing that in terms of where cost is otherwise gonna be going up over time if we just prioritize recharge in the most depleted aquifer or um, cones of depression and don't pay attention to the community needs. Yeah, and I would add too that it's important for the communities to get involved in that process too. So we all have an understanding of their operations, how they operate their well fields and how we can optimize that operation to then help with the water quality. So uh, that, that's another um, item to, to add to, to the management zone nexus. <laughs> yeah. I think yes. speaking speaking back to lisa's point and what i see in the question is there is there is there are huge concerns about the immediate water quality impacts from recharge and and you know, whether it's nitrate or whether it's legacy pesticides or whether it's naturally occurring um contaminants arsenic hexavalent chromium or uranium those those all linger out there and and the challenge i think for doing this in the agricultural landscape is that you do not have necessarily the immediate funding that you may have in a community that's charging the equivalent of $1,200 or $1,500 an acre foot for the water that they sell to their customers in, a, in, in any of the larger urban areas we have in, in California that do engage in, in groundwater recharge and do engage in, in intensive investi site investigations to make sure that they're not running into water quality issues of one kind or another with their recharge operations. And, and that upfront investment would be prohibitive for a grower to do. And the question, the question is, how do we, A, how do we incentivize growers to do recharge? Um, and B, how do we make sure that the communities that are impacted by that recharge water in one way or another are not going to have a water quality issue either in the short run or the, or the long run. Um, and I think with respect, I'm gonna start answering and I'm hoping that others can provide some answers here as well or some insights. You know, with respect to the, um, the um, naturally occurring contaminants, contaminants, arsenic, you know, especially in, in, in the deeper system, hexavalent chromium mostly on the west side, um, and then uranium um, a lot on the east side uh, of the San Joaquin Valley. Um, those are issues that we need to address. I see a big research need there and address those from the perspective of you know, what's happening at the small scale and how does that scale up to the, the source area of a public, public supply well, where you don't really care what's happening in a small core that's this size um, or a monitoring well that has a screen that's you know, 20 feet long or 10 feet long, but you have a screen that's 50 feet long or 100 feet long, that's averaging all kinds of water. How do we make sure and how do we know 
where to prioritize research in ways that avoids those. I think that's a, that's a research issue that we need to address urgently. But with respect to um, then developing those guidances for local, for local conditions, is it possible to, to develop a generic guidance, Phil, Daniel, or Lisa and yeah, Charlotte? I think that's the big, yeah. I, I, I don't think generic, I, I think when you say generic guidance, I think somebody asked the question, you know, you know do, you have to, do you have to do a monitoring at every single site? And you know that will never happen in terms of the cost. I mean, we, we won't we won't see recharge occurring. It'll, it'll all return to very large, you know, recharge basins because that's the only way that can be afforded. Um, but I think the the kind of mapping that you've done, Thomas, as a guidance um, is probably the question is is it sufficient? And um, I just noticed Casey's comment in here. There's um, sort of a strategy he put out here around you know, good source control program through irrigated lands program, dairy, general order, et cetera. Um, maximizing recharge, I would say, on sites where risk is low based on, um, you know, historic legacy land uses, uranium known locations, wherever, wherever the mapping shows those risks, we have to avoid or, or prioritize for those conditions. Um, and then providing a drinking water mitigation alternative. Um, and being ready to do that if, if an unintended consequence occurs. Um, you know, it, it, we're not, there's never gonna be enough money for every farm to have a, a monitoring well installed to, to test what, or, or a core to test what's underneath that farm. And I think what Phil's shown from, you know, the work that he's done, and it's really a mass balance question on the nitrate and salt side, but the uranium side, is, I, that's, that's the piece I'm, I'll let others speak to that. And can I just yeah. bring up one thing? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, within the chat, there's been discussion about um, preferential pathways. And we've talked a lot about legacy um, inputs and concerns about legacy pesticides and fertilizer use. Um, and, you know, we always, I, I've talked to folks who think of it as this bank, right? That is all going to be um, flushed to groundwater as we as we implement these um, recharge projects. Can we talk, can someone talk about preferential pathways? And the question in the chat was, is there a way we can predict the preferential pathways and kind of get a better feel for how, how big a threat these legacy constituents are in the Vado zone? Um, I mean, I'll let, I'll let Thomas kick over this in a, in a, in a second. I, I think he probably has a better feel for that. But, but you know, the data that we've done where we've gone down 30, 30 feet in our cores in the Central Valley in several places. We're not really, you know, we don't see any surprise. We're not really seeing surprises as far as nitrate concentrations down, down through the, um, through those cores. You know, Thomas showed somewhere he's showing quite a, a lot of distribution. Um, in, and I assume that's in response to uh, limiting layers, uh, slowing water down and allowing things to, 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 um, to concentrate. But you know, our, our, our data shows that, you know, you're, you're still flushing a fair amount um, of the sites that we've done. So um, we're not really seeing evidence that, uh, that the preferential pathways are, are really constraining uh, nitrate and salt movement, although I, I'm sure in some places they would be, but um, by and large, we haven't seen that in, in, in sort of the places that we've been Doing recharge. I don't know if Thomas wants to add to that. Yeah, I can, you know, the preferential pathways are interesting. It's a, it's a phenomenon that you have in the unsaturated zone. And it's, it, it's partly because we have quite a bit of sand. It's partly because we have so much heterogeneity and they seem to develop, they seem to develop even at, you know, below, below the root zone. We, we know of preferential pathways in the root zone just from root, you know, root decayed root canals and, and what animals do. But even below that, we think that those preferential pathways exist. And to the degree we have had 100 years of flood irrigation in the Central Valley, all these preferential pathways have been set. And as somebody mentioned, you know, they, they, are, they are there to stay under given moisture conditions. Um, the, the only way they would, they would change is if, if we're looking at much, much smaller flows. But at high, you know, at, at wet, under wet conditions, 
a preferential pathway is kind of baked into, or it's, it's, it's footprinted into the structure of the unsaturated zone. And it, it, it's not going to move, not going to move around unless water quality was to change so drastically, incoming water quality, that there would be some kind of precipitation of minerals. But in general, in general, these preferential pathways exist, and to the degree that we've done these flood irrigation schemes for so long, they've really been primed up for, you know, until we invented micro sprinklers and, and drip irrigation. They've essentially been primed up under flood and flow irrigation and probably flushed out a lot of things um, that were there that would have been of concern, um, some of which are, is now in groundwater. Um, but also are not, probably not, they don't lend themselves, in my understanding, I would have to think about this more, but in my understanding to, to the accumulation or concentration of, of chemicals just by their nature. Yeah, I think, I think um, when we talk about, you know, the, the Vedos zone legacy, stuff with nitrate, nitrates and salts. You know, the worst case condition is assuming that your preferential pathways are not really playing much of a, much of a role and that you're mostly flushing out what you have, you know? And, and so, you know, the evidence we have is that you're flushing 80 to 90% out of those, of that legacy material uh, in, in the sites we've looked at. So, you know, you can go and look at the nutrient loading maps and, 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 and in land uses and, and what the cores look like deeper down and probably come up with an estimate of, you know, what is the, what is the potential bank of legacy materials that you can flush into the, your groundwater? And then you can say, well, how much water do you need for that? You know, and, and that sort of is the most simple way of a guidance. You know, if you have, you know, you know, 10 units of nitrate, you know, well, you need, you know, a million units of water. And, and so, um, you know, I think that um, the, 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 concept, the the statement that uh, Casey made about the, you know, the program, you know, um, you can certainly, you know, identify what kind of recharge you need to, to, to control the potential for groundwater quality issues as related to salts and nitrates. Now, when you start talking with these other, other constituents, well, maybe, maybe in those situations, you're really trying to do avoidance you know, and just try to, you know, if, it, if it's a real problem somewhere, avoid it. So you don't have to worry about those constituents getting into groundwater. The, um, you know, there is a lot of interest in groundwater wells and, and, and their potential use monitoring wells for, for looking at things. Um, you know, the, the issue with that is that, you know, unless it's right under the site, you know, you may be looking 40 years back, like Lisa's just talked about with regard to some of the things you're seeing in the groundwater program now. And so even, even like a reasonably stout groundwater monitoring network may not be as effective as we develop our management practices to, to sort of other tools on, you know, what kind of loading do we think we have? What kind of water do we need? And stuff like that, because that, that is sort of like, you know, what's happening now versus like what, what happened 30 years ago and, and how do we fix it? So, you know, if you're a, a groundwater well network, you know, even if it's pretty robust, it's, it's going to have a hard time telling you what's happening now, um, just because it will take time for water to get to those networks, nodes. Yeah, um, on on that issue and the general issue of um, general guidance and, and screening, um, I think something like that is going to be a bit easier for nitrates and, and pesticides and for some of the geogenic um, pollutants, for example. Um, nitrates, um, just, it, I'm thinking of like a kind of a tiered strategy in terms of like, can we set some thresholds, for example, for historical lo loading rates? Um, Thomas's group has already developed you know, estimates of, of nitrogen loading rates, as, as he talked about, um, his, historical loading rates. And so can we set some kind of threshold to say like below which, you know, at a site if the historical loading rates are below a certain threshold, is it, just, can we just consider that okay, no further evaluation needed? Um, if they're somewhat above that threshold, um, maybe some additional evaluation is needed. Um, for pesticides, you know, it's a bit more complicated because there are a lot of current use pesticides and it's hard to look at every one of them. 
but I think starting with, um, for example, the pesticides that are on the current groundwater protection list, um, the ones that are more likely to um, be mobilized to groundwater um, and cause problems, you could start with them. And I think it would actually be fairly straightforward, although it would be a bit of work to um, address those pesticides and come up with some general guidelines for, again, developing a threshold, like how much, how much historical um, application over the last um, decade or two would be considered acceptable versus needing further evaluation. Um, I think you know, it gets a little more complicated with pesticides that are already in the groundwater. Um, just for example, when I was looking at the, the GSPs and the the, um, the data on existing pollutants in the groundwater around some of the um, proposed or potential research, uh, recharge locations identified. Um, for example, the, you know, in the, in the gamma database, there might be a number of locations where TCP was a de uh, detected above MCLs in the vicinity, but nothing, you know, nothing right at the recharge site, and maybe nothing, you know, there, there just weren't any any data right at the recharge site or between the recharge site and domestic wells. So in a case like that, it's, it's a bit harder to provide some general screening, probably for further evaluation would be needed. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure that we wanna just say that um, if you find um, problems in the groundwater at a site, then it's not a good site for recharge because I think that could really limit um, first of all, it could really most most of these locations have something in the groundwater that's been detected to be a problem, um, and also there could be potential you know large scale benefits for using recharge to to um, help help mitigate those problems. So I, I think with a lot of the contaminants, it does unfortunately get a lot more complicated and re is really site specific. Yeah, I guess I guess uh, you know it, it it does come down to this idea that Daniel has talked about of of you know the high recharge rate sites you know s limited sites at, you know or at least tiered sites you know so that you can you can kind of contain your your potential exposure and and I think that you know the unfortunate truth with climate change and its management um, is that you know we're going to see periods where we have higher floods, you know, greater flows, uh, and, and, and events that require sort of mobilization of large areas of land to kind of capture and contain that water. Um, even, even potentially if we get into some very big reservoir reoperation where we're trying to, to use the reservoirs more, more for buffering and capturing and distributing surface wa um, water rather than storing it. Uh, but, but you know, aside from those events, we could probably contain, you know, on-farm recharge and Agmar type stuff to more limited to to somewhat limited sites where where you're for the most part managing these water quality uh, issues just through through dilution, you know. Um, and then in in periods where you start having to mobilize a lot of land, well, maybe those those sites become sort of low-rate sites. And they just don't have the opportunity to mobilize that much. You know, you're you're doing a wide. You know, what's better? You know, is it is it is it the high rate site, the low rate site, or the mid mid rate site? It's a classic, you know, Goldilocks uh, or three bears thing. You know, you know, it, you know, and 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 maybe the maybe actually the worst site is the mid rate site. You know, the mid rate site where where you 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 end up having kind of ho hum recharge rates and. And you and you provide yourself the great experience, opportunity for mobilization, where a high recharge rate site you you mobilize but you dilute, and and the lo really low rate sites you don't mobilize that much and you're more of a safety valve, you know. So there may be some kind of strategies one can Im impose, you know. And I think that, you know, um, Charlotte talked about the CV Salts program. It'd be nice if we could like move forward in in all of this sort of with a common set of tools. That, that we have available with us so that we can try to, you know, come up with smart ways of implementing that are not imposing more, um, more burdens on, 
uh, the people who are participating. So. Yeah, I agree, Phil. Um, and then the other component is funding. I mean, thresholds there, it, it seems like a really simple uh, application of, of something, but, but really you have to understand locally what that means and how you get to that understanding will take a lot of funding um, and, and a lot of resources to get to, to a point where you could um, scientifically justify a threshold of, of some kind um, for specific areas. Um, and, and even with uh, the current regulations and what we're required to do with our management zone is going to cost a lot of money just in, in what we're, we're doing uh, with the preliminary proposals currently and understanding the water quality in the area and um, knowing what, what, uh, what the early action plan that we're gonna develop is gonna look like and how much that's gonna cost in the future to provide those short-term solutions. Um, so so that's, that's another, you know, the bottom line. Oops. I'm just looking at the time. We've got 10 minutes. I wanna give each of the panelists like a minute or two to just kind of wrap up their thoughts. And then there are some irrigate lands questions in the chats. So I'm gonna answer that at the very end. Um, how about we start with you, Daniel? Do you have any last minute thoughts? Yeah, the, um, I, I think that the whole issue, you know, basically the framework that the um, flood monitor RAC came up with is, is, is an important way to think about it is we need to compile the data. We need to have the data available. Um, there are clearly some gaps in the knowledge that need to be filled. And then we need tools to make decisions. Um, I would hate to see, I mean, all that's gonna take time. As Charlotte just said, that's time, that's money. Um, there's, there's lack of information, but we don't wanna let that stop the potential benefit of, of replenishing groundwater supplies. And so it's this, this fine balance between, um, you know, part of the question is, are we seeing significant problems for when, where recharge is already occurring? And there's certainly a lot of, of really good cases, you know, um, from recharge basins where they've actually improved water quality in, locally and improved um, drinking water quality um, and quantity. So I think maybe, maybe one of the questions here is to be thinking about, um, there was a comment from Matt um, around, you know, are there, are there do documented problems um, and are we creating, do, do, what level of screening and, and, and um, criteria to evaluate sites do we need to develop and make sure that that's consistent with the relative risk? And um, so I think I've heard several really good suggestions here. Term, certainly in terms of the irrigated lands program, that's essential in terms of ongoing source control. You know, that, that, that piece is, is essential. The avoidance of key you know, contaminants that are uh, geogenic, you know, those, those are places where we need more information and mapping to know what that is. And then the, the, the middle zone that Phil's talking about is, you know, if we can prioritize and focus water on fewer sites and in all the places, the districts I've worked with, there's never been a need for every field for the amount of water that's available. Maybe in the wettest, wettest year, we might need more land, but there's always the opportunity to to prioritize and focus that water on the places with the lowest risk. And it seems to me that's, you know, based on the available information, that's where we should be focused right now. As, and then as information is developed, we can de determine what those thresholds are um, for, for future um, risk reduction. Thomas, I'm just gonna start. Yeah, um, you know, I think what I, what I, looking through the question and specifically with respect to the water quality aspect, what I see is there is a huge need and I take this as a challenge really to the research community, um, a need to um, help the communities that may be impacted by water quality issues from recharge, um, help them understand um, what the risk is as much as those that do the recharge um, and figure out ways to better understand the role, especially of, uh, well, I think for one, you know, the bump that's going to come when you do flush things out, how long that lasts, um, better understanding that. And we've done some work in, in that direction. But I think 
the, the uh, naturally occurring contaminants and really understanding those and some of the legacy pesticides and how that may impact domestic wells or public water supplies. We do have some work to do just to make sure that the communities that um, may be impacted can rely on, on that work as a way to say, yes, there is a, there is a minimal risk in fact, for things to happen. Um, there are ways we can monitor those risks and do some degree of um, adaptive management to avoid that we'll eventually end up with something that we didn't want in the first place. Um, so I think that's, that's really sort of the, the biggest lift um, in order to eventually make it possible to um, do this at the, lar at the larger scale, you know, and probably with dedicated fields or dedicated basins, as um, was just pointed out, um, and, and make, sh make sure we're not ending up in water quality issues being the ones that hold up doing the research, which I think we all agree on is really going to be an important equation to sustainable groundwater management. But we do have to answer those questions. We can't just rely on hypothesis and, and past experiences, we really have to answer those questions in a solid way and, and figure out some, of, some affordable monitoring to protect those communities from any unwanted outcomes. Thank you, Thomas. Lisa? Um, yeah, I, um, I agree there's kind of a dilemma with the monitoring because it's a balance between doing enough um, to get information, but obviously we, we can't do a high level of monitoring at every site, um, especially for, you know, when there's so many different potential um, contaminants involved. Um, but I, I like the idea of selecting some some recharge projects and doing more targeted um, monitoring and really trying to focus that based on the, the areas of uncertainty with some of those, um, especially with maybe some of the geogenic contaminants. Um, and, you know, one thing I want to point out is um, that, that um, I see Debbie has mentioned a couple of times in the chat, it's just the importance of engaging communities when making these decisions. Um, you know, they may or may not be okay with, for example, like a short-term um, deterioration of, of water quality if it's going to mean longer-term benefits, but they also may or may not be okay with the level of uncertainty um, and um, in, involved in, you know, knowing, knowing whether there could be adverse effects or not. And some of those effects might take a long time to develop. Um, I know, you know, in some cases now we're seeing immediate improvement with respect to nitrates, but for some of the current use pesticides, it could take, you know, another decade or two to see um, the effects of that if they do end up being mobilized by, um, by the, you know, acceleration of water moving through the, the soil and the Vado zone and into the groundwater. So it might take a while to see some of those negative effects. Charlotte, last thoughts. Um, I think that collaboration is, is important here. And um, I think that definitely the involvement of communities that, that Lisa mentioned it, is a key uh, aspect to this and how, how we can do this in a way that is beneficial for our aquifer, beneficial for our communities is going to be a delicate balance and it's going to take some time to have those conversations. Um, and um, I'm going to do a shameless plug for the management zone one more time and say, get involved in your management zone, understand what's happening in your area, because really it's going to take a regional, regional look at, at what's happening to really determine what those solutions are and, and uh, be active in that process. Thank you. Phil. Yeah, um, I guess, I think Daniel, you know, brought up this important issue that things are happening now. And you can certainly see it in a lot of what the GSA, GSAs are doing and the GSP documents have come out and stuff like that. And, um, and so I think that to some extent, you know, there's there's two issues, two things that, you know, one is like trying to move forward in a, in a conservative, somewhat conservative way. Um, 
as far as trying to, to, to not with regard to amount of water recharge, but with regard to making sure that you can kind of protect yourself against these unanticipated consequences. And that, that really comes down to like a management planning, engineering, you know, best available science type thing. Um, and, and I think that we, there's probably a lot known right now that we can kind of move intelligently forward in that, in that way. I, I think, um, you know, history is, is, is full of um, examples of where the best engineering management planning and available science leads to unintended consequences. And, and I just think that you're going to have them. And, and then, then, it's, then that'll be the next, you know, to be a little callous next jobs bill. I mean, I think that, you know, there's, this is a problem we have now and we'll have to do the best we can to, to, to mitigate it and, and to, to, to manage it and then keep moving forward with the monitoring and the science so that we can try to, 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 if these problems are coming up that we're not dealing with well, we can change our direction. I think the other, the other thing is it is really is a regional, regional uh, and statewide issue. You know, it goes all the way from local involvement in the, in the GSA and, and CV salt communities and those communities to, you know, working with the state on how they want to manage their water in the future. Um, and, and that um, is an, in the federal government and, 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 and getting that change um, will be a big lift. I mean, there's definitely movement at DWR and, and uh, to start thinking about how they reoperate their reservoirs. Uh, but, um, it, and, and there are water rights. I want to talk about that. But, you know, those are things that are big issues that take a long time to, 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 to overcome. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, the presenters, the panelists, um, the participants. I, I just want to say, I mean, there are a couple of questions about why are we talking about this in the Irrigate Lands Program? We did dedicate the March meeting to the coordination between Irrigate Lands, CV Salts, and Sigma. I do think it's critical that those, those processes are coordinated as much as possible and that we continue to have these communications, right? I want to um, really thank our presenters, thank our panelists. I th want to thank all of you for participating. I know that we didn't get to all of your chats. Um, and I, you know, it was never the intent that we're going to resolve everything. But I do think that um, the goal was to kind of get a better shared understanding of the issues. And I know I learned a lot today. I hope you did as well. Like I mentioned earlier, this is being recorded. I will post the recording on the um, Central Valley Water Board's Irrigate Lands website. Folks have asked for the presentations as well. As long as the presenters are okay, I'll, I'll send those out via Lyris List. Um, and I just want to mention for the regular stakeholders, there will be, I am planning to have an October um, stakeholder meeting. It's uh, scheduled for October 14th. And I will be sending out a Lyris List email about that as well. But I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We're two minutes over. Um, really appreciate you spending the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Sue, Thanks, Sue Thank for you. the opportunity. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sue.